Hello, welcome to Telesur. I'm Carla Gonzalez in Quito, and this is from the South. The Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, together with allied nations, reached an agreement to reduce oil production by 23% in an initial period of two months. The move comes as the ninth OPEC ministerial conference saw countries propose curbs to boost sinking crude prices during the virtual meeting on Thursday. Russia, Saudi Arabia and allied producers have agreed to cut a combined 10 million barrels per day. In the Caribbean, Guyana's Elections Commission has agreed to a recount of ballots from the March 2nd general elections. We have con continued on the, on the position that we are going to do a recount. I think we've agreed that the venue which the recount should be done should be the Convention Center. But of course that is subject to permission being granted to use the center. I would like, hardly like to think the permission of not we agreed on the... In Brazil, health authorities informed the detection of the first case of the new coronavirus among the Yanomani people, an Amazon indigenous group known for its remoteness and its vulnerability to foreign diseases. A Yanomani 15-year-old boy is being treated at a hospital in Boa Vista, the capital of the northern state of Roraima. Brazil is home to an estimated 800,000 indigenous people from more than 300 ethnic groups. Today, we had a confirmed case in the Yanomami, which concerns us a lot. This is a government concern for indigenous health. Venezuela has announced that almost 50% of confirmed COVID-19 patients have recovered. Communications Minister Jorge Rodriguez said authorities reported only four new cases in the last 24 hours. Meanwhile, 84 people out of the country's 171 confirmed cases have been discharged from hospitals after testing negative for the virus and showing no symptoms. Almost 50% of all infected people has already recovered. And when we say recovered, it is not like in other countries such as Colombia, where they count them recovered even if they tell people to remain in their houses. 85% of the confirmed cases stay in their homes, and that increases infections inside families. These are the cases that are present in Colombia. Venezuela cares for its patients as we provide free medicine, and as I've said earlier, almost half all confirmed cases have already recovered. Rodriguez also warned about the risk of imported cases due to the fastest spread of the virus in Colombia. At the moment, Colombia is considered to be the main source of infections for Venezuelans due to the arrival of people from Colombia. We have established a control point in the locality of Ureña and we are going to be much more cautious, much more strict and careful to find illegal crossings. We have seen a decrease in the transit of travelers from Europe, but in the case of Colombia, it was accelerated by the simple fact that this epidemic is not controlled over there in any ways. There is no proper record of cases and that poses a risk for the strict control we are doing here in Venezuela. In Ecuador, there are now more than 7,000 cases of COVID-19. The city of Guayaquil is the hardest hit with almost 4,000 cases alone. The mayor, Cynthia Viteri, who had previously claimed to have the disease, said on Thursday that she recovered and then she left her house to visit a local hospital. This hospital, thank God, hasn't been infected, and doctors here are making sure it stays that way. So my intention is to bring new equipment here so pregnant women can come here because they can't go to other hospitals because they would be risking their lives and the lives of the elderly who are dying one by one. If you watch the news, they are dying every day. This is a silent war. We see them die, but we don't hear gunshots. Now to Mexico, where concerns are being raised about violence against women during the quarantine. Stay-at-home orders can be a great risk for women who live with their aggressors. A national network of shelters helps women who have been victims of violence in Mexico. I was physically and sexually abused, even economically, all sorts of violence from my partner. He would beat me up at night when my daughters were asleep. The next day they would see the marks on my face. In the times of the global pandemic, this situation worsens for those who live with their aggressors. 
Forty percent of femicides take place in the victim's own home. This shows that many women's homes are the most dangerous place for them. Eighty percent of the women we give shelter to were victims of violence in their own homes. While staying at home is the most effective way to stop the spread of COVID-19, health authorities, since social distancing measures started to be enforced on March 23rd, distress calls to the shelters have increased by 60 percent and requests to be sheltered by 30 percent. You must also consider that many cannot stay at home every day because they have no stable source of income. This, in turn, aggravates violent situations, often affecting women and children. For its part, the government has launched a support system through the 911 emergency phone number. While isolation can generate a stress or conflict within families, this can never justify violence. The National Women Institute has made a call on families to use the time under quarantine to question gender roles and to more equally distribute domestic tasks. After this break, mass graves in the state of New York for COVID-19 deaths. So don't go away. Welcome back. Let's continue with news. The Prime Minister of St. Lucia, Alan Chastanet, is appealing to creditors to give people relief as the country battles COVID-19 and as it prepares for hurricane season. I firmly believe that tourism will remain a big part of our economic fortunes in the future. I'm appealing to all creditors to demonstrate compassion by providing relief to persons indebted to you. This includes landlords, higher purchases, companies, and others. Unfortunately, we're currently faced with a drought amidst the destabilizing effects of COVID-19. In addition, the 2020 hurricane season is also not too far away. This all makes the situation and challenges somewhat daunting. But with our collective efforts, we can and we shall overcome these threats. The government of St. Kitts and Nevis has extended the country's state of emergency to come back to the pandemic to April 18th. A 24-hour lockdown was also implemented on Thursday from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. on April 16th. As of Thursday, 11 people tested positive for the novel coronavirus, and St. Kitts initially implemented a 24-hour limitation of movement on March 31st that was expected to end on April 3rd. Now to other news, Jamaica's Prime Minister Andrew Holness has extended the nation's COVID-19 restrictions for the Easter holiday. The stay-at-home measures were expected to end on April 7th. During the Easter weekend, the curfew will be from Friday the 10th of April 2020 through Monday the 13th of April 2020. The curfew will commence at 3 p.m. in the afternoon and end at 7 a.m. the next morning. In other words, the non-curfew hours, that is the period of time that you will be able to move about freely and conduct the essentials of life, would be from 7 a.m to 3 p.m. daily over the Easter weekend. The Cayman Islands is now the fifth country in the world and second in the Caribbean to report medical equipment being seized by the United States amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Barbados, Canada, Germany, and France have all had the same complaint. The, um, the U.S. authorities actually uh, removed from a vessel, a, a shipping, a ship, that was coming to Cayman, a container which contained eight ventilators and 50,000 masks and various other um, bits and pieces which I don't have the details of. And um, so that has been a huge disappointment to us. All of those were, were things that were produced and purchased in the United States. 
In Cuba, free medical health care for all citizens has been one of the pillars of the revolution. So let's have a look at how this system is handling the COVID-19 pandemic. In these days, marked by the novel coronavirus, these images are exclusive to Cuba. Good morning. We are medical students and we are doing a survey on the health of the population to see if they have symptoms. Over 25,000 medical students visit Cuban homes to detect and prevent new cases of the pandemic. People are grateful, not just because they are being cared for, but because they are being reassured that things are under control. The ongoing search for possible infections is part of the island's health care system. Have you had any respiratory symptom? Anyone from your household? It has over 100,000 doctors as well as nine specialists for every 1,000 residents. Since 1984, the development of a family care program has been an essential part of the system as well, providing one doctor to every community. This framework is Cuba's greatest strength, something that was developed over many years and that has been improved over time with better training and resources. This allows thousands of med school students to make home visits. Despite foreign pressure and shortages caused by the decades-old U.S. blockade, the island has guaranteed free health care to the entire population, while also helping other nations across the globe. Over 50 years we have been providing help. Since 1963, over 450,000 health professionals across various generations have saved over 7 million lives. Biotechnology is one of the best developed fields in Cuba, with close to 20,000 workers moving forward with many advancements, including the interferon alpha-2b, which has proven to be essential in the global fight against the novel coronavirus. The Cuban interferon has been worked on for over 30 years. There is a lot of experience working with it for other illnesses. We know it helps patients build an immunity, and we believe it will continue to be essential to fight the coronavirus. Doctors, not bombs, that is the message Cuba has long defended, and that has led to over 600 Cuban doctors to be deployed to more than 14 countries affected by the pandemic. We are an army of white ones, willing to share our knowledge and save lives anywhere in the world. Amidst a near campaign aimed at the Iceland humanitarian program and a global pandemic that has put on display the fragility of developed nations' health system, Cuba is strengthening its system with solidarity and a guarantee of life over money. In the United States, inmates at Cook County Jail in Chicago are demanding to be released or transferred as the building has become one of the largest coronavirus clusters in the country. A judge on Thursday rejected the inmates' petition to move them out of the jail, which houses 4,500 people. Cook County Jail has 276 inmates who have tested positive for COVID-19, along with 172 staff members of the Cook County Sheriff's Office, which oversees the facility. However, the jail acknowledged those numbers are likely an undercount, as the majority of its inmates have not been tested. What I'm hearing from people inside the prison is that the conditions are very, what you might say, unclean. It's uh, non-sanitary. Uh, you have a lot of situations going on. People are still housed around each other, and it's not good. Authorities in the city of New York have begun burying coronavirus victims in mass graves as the death toll continues to rise. Aerial footage posted on social media shows workers wearing hazmat suits and other personal protective equipment while digging graves and stacking wooden coffins in deep trenches on the city's Hart Island. With more than 160,000 confirmed cases, New York State now has more than any country in the world. Coming up, a campaign calls for the end of the blockade against Venezuela, Cuba, and Iran so they can fight the COVID-19. Stay with us. Thank you for joining us again. After over two months in quarantine, the Chinese government lifted the lockdown on April 8th on the city of Wuhan, where the novel coronavirus first emerged last December. 
This is what Wuhan looked like a mere two months ago. And this is what Wuhan looks like now. The original epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic, the city of 11 million is slowly living up after enforcing a strict quarantine to stop the virus. Greetings from Wuhan. Today is day 76 of the quarantine and most restrictions have been lifted. But there are still controls in place to protect the population. The city looks colorful, full of life, with joy. People are full of optimism. Latin American and Caribbean youth who were there when the worst of the pandemic hit Wuhan were finally able to leave their homes. During the quarantine, I stayed at home for around 65 days. On day 66, we found out that the community where we live was free of the pandemic. On April 5th, we received a certificate of health, which allows us access to certain places. That was an exciting day. At first, I was nervous, because you don't know if they took the right decision, but the feeling of freedom is extraordinary. I miss the dynamics of the city, the movement, walking amongst other people. This is a safe city. You can enjoy your time here. You can see the Yangtze River, enjoy a cup of coffee. I miss all of that, but I think we will slowly recover it. To exit Wuhan and to move around the city, everyone needs to present a green QR code that verifies their health. A mobile app was developed by the government that certifies that people are in perfect health. When they want to exit the city, citizens need to show this code to prove they are in good health. If that is the case, their code is green. This app doesn't work for us foreigners at the moment, so we need to show a certificate of health. The lockdown and the strict measures imposed by the Chinese government left vital lessons for the globe. Lessons that need to be heeded now that the pandemic is ravaging the American continent and Europe. Reading helped me get through this time, studying and occupational therapy as well. This was a fruitful time for my mental health. I was at the epicenter of all this, and I did not know what was going to happen. Nobody knew. Thankfully, I never feel ill, and I knew that if I followed the measures, I would get through the situation. This way of thinking helped a lot. Our experience was intense, but it was also frustrating. We needed to learn many things, and now we need to transmit that knowledge to our nations, so they may follow the same road China paved to stop the virus. Wuhan will be scarred by the experience for generations to come, and life in the city will never be the same as before. COVID-19 hit Wuhan particularly hard, as the majority of China's 3,300 deaths happened there. But still, the city is rising back, showing the world that there is a light at the end of the dark tunnel. And Italy, one of the worst hit countries by the coronavirus, is seeing a reduction in the number of people in intensive care. Health officials say over 140,000 have been infected as local hospitals struggle to cope with it. Additionally, 610 people have died between Wednesday and Thursday, bringing the country's death toll to over 18,000. Civil Protection Special Commissioner for the Coronavirus, Angelo Borelli, told the nation on Friday that the number of patients in intensive care decreased by 88 units. Today, the total number of positive people is 96,867, with an increase of 1,615 patients, as opposed to yesterday. Of those, 3,605 are in intensive care. The number of patients in intensive care decreased by 88 units. 28,399 are those hospitalized with symptoms. Here, too, we have a decrease of 86 units compared to yesterday. Most patients with coronavirus are in isolation without symptoms or with light symptoms. And the total number of isolated patients is 64,877, 67% of the total. Today, unfortunately, we register 610 new deceased, while the total of those recovered reaches 28,470. That is 1,979 more than yesterday. The new number of infected are 4,204, bringing to 143,626 the total cases. Spain has reported its lowest daily tally of coronavirus deaths 
since March 23rd, with 605 fatalities in 24 hours. In the last 24 hours, we have recorded 4,576 new coronavirus cases, which gives a total of 157,022 infections. Based on these figures, the increase in the number of cases today is 3%. This means we're continuing the downward trend we have observed. The increase in the number of cases in the hospital and intensive care units is also 3% today as it was in the case of the previous days. And regarding the total number of deaths, that figure stands at 15,843, with 605 fatalities in one day. Additionally, 55,000 people have recovered and left the hospital. A hospital in Barcelona converted seven floors of wards to be entirely used to treat patients with COVID-19. Hospital officials say that every doctor, even last year medical students, have been deployed to help with the pandemic. Every day coming 60, 70 patients with severe conditions. Every doctor here, even the, you know, the surgeons, the, the urologists, the ophthalmologists have been taking care of medical patients, respiratory patients, which is very unusual. Even students, medical students, in the last year of their careers have been recruited to take care of these patients. In South Africa, the Economic Freedom Fighters Party has condemned what it called shameful attempts by U.S. President Donald Trump to remove the director of the World Health Organization. The party says the international community must unite against Trump's attempts to destabilize the WHO in a time when the COVID-19 pandemic is threatening humanity. Trump had accused the WHO of being too focused on China, of issuing bad advice on the pandemic, and threatened to remove part of its funding. The South African Communist Party has reiterated its call for the United States to lift the unilateral coercive measures it has imposed on Cuba, Venezuela, and Iran. The sanctions against countries, as we are currently facing the COVID-19 pandemic, we call for the end to the criminal embargo against Cuba. We call for the United States not to impose any further sanction and instead to lift sanctions against Venezuela. And we also call upon the United States and other countries to lift sanctions against countries like Iran. This is no time for sanctions, but these are times to actually unite and for humanity to together fight against the current challenges that we are facing. A campaign by ALBA movements and the International People's Assembly is calling for the end of sanctions to save lives amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Claudia de la Cruz of the People's Forum in New York says the Trump administration has shown disregard for human life during the pandemic and has warned about the actions being taken against Venezuela. As many of you know, uh, the U.S. ruling class is taking advantage of this moment of crisis to boost its war against the working class at home and abroad. The Trump administration has taken this moment in particular to weaponize uh, the virus that is attacking so many of our communities, particularly the poor and working class, and allowing many of those communities to die. In the U.S., uh, the incompetence and negligence of the government in response to the virus pandemic has resulted in the infection of more than 300,000 people and the death of over 10,000 people. The U.S. government's blatant disregard for human life is both immoral and criminal. In just a few days, the U.S. government has seized ventilators going to Barbados um, that are key to island capacity to save lives in response to this crisis. It has ordered the largest deployment of U.S. military um, in our continent in the last 30 years with its vicious um, fixation on Venezuela. It is important to remember that the latest attacks are just part of a string of aggression against the Bolivarian Revolution in an effort to crush it and also reaffirm U.S. dominance in the continent. So we have to see the geopolitics that play into into this, uh, these actions that are being taken at this particular moment in time. 
Groups from Latin America and Africa are participating in an international week of anti-imperialist struggle. We leave you with a video from the Twitter campaign called No War and Sanctions. So stay safe. Until next time.